One of the main uses of capacitors is to store energy. Let's think about gravity for a minute. If I have a motor that can do work on a mass by lifting it up in a gravitational field, I'm doing work on the system, increasing the system's potential energy. I can disconnect my motor and leave the mass at this higher position, and there's extra potential energy stored in the system. And then at some later time, I can release the mass and it'll gain kinetic energy and I can maybe harvest that and do work on something, get some of that energy back out of the system. The same is true with a capacitor. Here I have a parallel plate capacitor and I'm going to hook it up to a battery. The battery is going to move electrons around from one plate to the other. This side will end up with excess positive charge or it will be missing some electrons. And the other plate will end up with excess negatives. And so we've done work on those charges, separating them, moving them from one plate to the other. And there's stored potential energy in the system. We can disconnect the battery. And with the battery disconnected, there's just energy stored in the capacitor because of the charge separation that we created. Now we can hook something up to this capacitor. Maybe we hook up a light bulb. So I started on the left hand side with a parallel plate capacitor hooked up to a battery. The battery did work moving charges from one plate to the other. I've disconnected the battery. That's what the center image is on my screen. And it's just storing. The capacitor is just storing charge and energy and waiting for us to try to get that energy back out. And then, and then on the right hand side, I'm showing what would happen if we hooked up something like a light bulb to our capacitor. Those electrons all repel each other and they're trying to get as far apart from each other as they can. And as soon as we give them a path to go to the other side where they're attracted to those positives, they will take it. So the electrons will start to flow this direction and go to the other side. And those electrons flowing through the light bulb give it some energy, cause it to light up and we'll get that energy out of the light bulb. We're going to start drawing a lot of circuits. So we need to understand what symbols we use so we can represent all of our electrical devices in our drawings. A DC power supply or battery can be represented with one of these drawings. The long line on the left side indicates the higher potential side of the power supply or battery, the positive terminal. You can draw it either way. I'll try to draw it like the top one because the bottom one starts to look a lot like the symbol for a capacitor. What is the symbol for a capacitor? Well, most capacitors are parallel plate capacitors. So our symbol is two parallel lines, like a parallel plate capacitor. We also have resistors in our circuit. We'll learn more about resistors soon, but this is the symbol for it, and that's how we would represent it in our circuit drawings. Quite often in our circuits, we have more than one capacitor. So it's important to understand how to deal with combinations of capacitors. Two common ways to hook up electrical devices is what's called series and parallel. Capacitors in series would look something like this. You can see these three capacitors, C1, C2, and C3, are all hooked up in a line together. This is called a series circuit. An analogy I like for circuits is they're like hiking trails. And if you were on this hiking trail, you wouldn't have any choice. As you hiked around the trail, if you went through the first capacitor, you'd have to go through the second one and then the third one. That's how you know they're in series. There's no choice. There's no fork in the road where you can take a different path and bypass one of these. Another common way to hook up circuit elements is what's called parallel circuits.
Here I have three capacitors hooked up in parallel. You can see that if you were hiking along this hiking trail, you would have parallel paths to get to the other side. As you come around from the battery, there's a fork in the road. You can take a path through C3 to get to the other side, or you can take a path through C2 to get to the other side, or you can take a path through C1. These are parallel paths from point A to point B in the circuit. In order to analyze circuits that have multiple capacitors, we need to understand there are some rules as to how capacitors behave when they're hooked up in series or in parallel. Let's start with series circuits. If our capacitors are hooked up in series, like I'm showing here, we know the charge on every capacitor has to be the same. The charge on capacitor C1 equals the charge on capacitor C2 equals the charge on capacitor C3. So the charge on each of these capacitors is going to be the same, even if these capacitors have different values for their capacitance. And the charge on each capacitor is equal to the total charge in the system. You might say to yourself, wait a minute, I've got three capacitors here. Each one has a charge Q. How could the whole system only have a charge Q available? Well, let's think about what's happening. As this battery moves charges around, let's say the battery moves a charge from the left plate of C1 through the battery to the right plate of C3. It's moved an electron, so we're, we end up with a positive charge here, and an electron gets moved around and deposited on the plate over there at C3. A capacitor is an open circuit. There's no electrical connection between those plates. If there was, we wouldn't be able to move charges over and have them stay. They'd run right back to the other plate if there was an electrical connection between the plates. It's an open circuit, no electrical connection. So the charges that move through the battery are the ones that we're doing work on, and they're the ones that we're gonna get out in the end. Once one electron is moved around, what happens over there at C3? That electron repels an electron from the opposite plate, and that electron moves. So an electron moves and leaves a positive behind because it's repelled by the electron on the right plate of C3. And over here at C1, that positive charge attracts an electron leaving a positive behind. So internally, I'm gonna use green, internally here, those charges just redistribute based on what the battery is doing. You can see that if we took this circuit after we charge it all up, you can see why all the capacitors have the same charge now. And if we charged it up to a certain amount, remove the battery, and put a light bulb in its place. Well, how much charge would go through the light bulb? Only this, only the charges that are on the very outside would go through the battery, and all the ones in between in that green box would just go back, redistribute back to where they came from and not go through the light bulb. That's how you know you don't have that excess charge. So even though there are three capacitors in this circuit and each one stores a charge of Q, there's really only one Q available to us if we were to hook it up to a, to a flashlight or something else. There's only one Q available to us that we could get back out of it. The other thing that's convenient is to be able to combine these capacitors and think of them as a single capacitor. What one capacitor would I have to use to act the same as these three in series? We call that the equivalent capacitance. And for capacitors in series, the equivalent capacitance is determined with this formula. 
Of course, I drew my circuit with three capacitors, but it could have any number of them. If there were four or five or six, you would just continue this formula for four or five or six capacitors, whatever you need. You may be wondering where this equation for C equivalent comes from. Well, let's do it for a simple circuit with just two capacitors. We know the charge on each of these capacitors has to be the same. We also know that Q is equal to CV for a capacitor. So that means for capacitor one, the charge on that capacitor has to equal its capacitance times the potential difference across that capacitor. And the same is true for Q2. And we know that the potential difference across the first capacitor plus the potential difference across the second capacitor has to equal the potential difference across the battery. That's what's supplying the potential difference. And it's split between the two capacitors. Now I can just go back to some of these equations I wrote earlier and substitute in. The delta V for capacitor one is just its charge divided by its capacitance. Same for the potential difference across capacitor two. I also know that Q1 and Q2 are the same. I'm just gonna call it lowercase q here. And I wanna get this equation into the form Q equals CV. Q is equal to one over Q equals CV is our equation. Let's just write it in here. This is the total charge. This is the equivalent capacitance and that's how you derive it. Now let's look at the rules for capacitors in parallel. The first thing is that the potential difference across each capacitor in parallel is the same. And the equivalent capacitance is just the sum of the individual capacitances for these capacitors. C equivalent is C1 plus C2 plus C3, etc. I can imagine that fairly easily. I have a capacitor C1, I have a plate area here, and I hook up another capacitor in parallel to it. So basically I'm adding this plate area from capacitor two to that plate area from capacitor one. And what does that do? It just makes a bigger capacitor. I can just add the two together and get the new capacitance. If you wanna derive it, you can follow the steps I use for capacitors in series. The unit for the capacitance is the farad. Capital F is a symbol. The farad is a fairly large amount of capacitance. Typically, we see values of our capacitors and circuits that are microfarads or millifarads, sometimes picofarads, much, much smaller values. We are starting to see capacitances that are in the farad range. Those are the supercapacitors and ultracapacitors that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But typically in our circuits, it's usually microfarads or values in that area. Let's say I wanna make this circuit on the left. Two capacitors hooked up in series. One is twice as big as the other one. But I look in my drawer and I can't find capacitors that are those values. But I have lots of capacitors to choose from. What equivalent capacitor can I use with the same battery that will store the same amount of charge as these two capacitors in series? That's the equivalent capacitance. Since we're dealing with a series circuit, we use our series formula. <laughs> 
1 over c equivalent is 1 over c plus 1 over 2c, and I end up with 2 thirds c. Take a quick look at this circuit and see if you can find its equivalent capacitance. At first glance, it looks like these capacitors might be in parallel because the way I drew them opposite each other like this. But think of the circuit as a hiking trail. If you head out from the battery, you go through the first capacitor, and then you have to go through the second capacitor. There are no forks in the road. There are no branches for you to bypass one of them. If you go through the first one, you have to go through the second one. They are in series. And we just did this one. The answer would be the same as we got last time. Now take a look at this circuit and see if you can come up with one equivalent capacitor that when hooked up to the same battery would store the same amount of charge and energy as this circuit with three capacitors. I try to spot combinations right away. Here I can see these two capacitors are in parallel. Because if I started over here at point A, and I wanted to get to point B on the other side, there are two paths I can take, one through the first capacitor or one through the second capacitor. Those are two parallel paths between A and B. I can get through one capacitor without passing through the other one. These are parallel capacitors. Since these two capacitors are in parallel, I use my equation for parallel capacitors. C equivalent, I'll call it C equivalent one because I'm gonna do another equivalent capacitor in a minute. This is an intermediate capacitor I'm finding as I step my way through the problem. That's gonna be the capacitance of one plus the capacitance of the other one. So I can replace these two capacitors in parallel with a single capacitor that has a value of 2C. I'll do that now. Now I look at this circuit and I say this is like two capacitors in series. And I know my formula for series capacitors. So the equivalent capacitance is just C. I can replace all of these with one capacitor, value C. Now is a good time to point out some of the common applications we see for capacitors in our everyday circuits. First of all, here's an image with lots of different capacitors. They range in size from pretty small, less than the size of a dime, to pretty big, larger than this coffee mug, or even bigger in industrial applications. And they have all kinds of different uses. Today, I just wanna talk about a couple, mainly storing energy. A capacitor almost acts like a battery. It can store that energy and then deliver it very quickly later on. Often we use them in circuits where we need the, that energy to be released very quickly because we can't get it out of a battery in a short amount of time. Things like the old fashioned flash cameras would have a capacitor in them. And when you use the flash on the camera, you'd have to wait until the capacitor recharged because it would take the battery a little bit of time to charge up the capacitor. The capacitor could discharge very quickly through the flash bulb and you get that bright light. And in car stereos, as I've shown an image here of somebody's car stereo, if you want those big speakers, you need to be able to deliver power in bursts when it's needed, and capacitors are used for that. And you can see there's a large capacitor there between those two speakers. Most capacitors are pretty small, and they can't store a lot of charge, but, with the advances in nanotechnology, they can make all kinds of nanostructures 
with little tube nanotubes and what does that do it creates tons and tons of surface area lots and lots of surface area and we saw earlier that our capacitance depended on surface area right that's where the charge builds up on those surfaces so if you can create these nanotube structures with all this surface area you can have really high amount of charge stored in your capacitor and that's the idea behind ultra capacitors or super capacitors you hear them called by both names these ultra capacitors or super capacitors are getting so big now they can store so much energy they're almost like a little battery but without all the downsides of a battery and one of the main things is that a battery is a chemical reaction that's taking place. So in order to charge the battery, you have to reverse that chemical reaction. And that takes time. That is not instantaneous. We use batteries to store energy in cars when we incorporate regenerative braking systems. So as a car is moving down the street, it has lots of kinetic energy because of its speed moving down the street. You hit the brakes in the old days, the brake pads squeezed the drum and friction slowed your car down and all that kinetic energy of your car heated up the air around your car, went into dissipated as heat into the air around your car. It was wasted. Nowadays, we have regenerative braking. And when you hit the brakes on your car, if you have an electric car or a hybrid car, when you hit those brakes, a generator starts to charge a battery and that energy going into the battery is stored your car slows down and stops what slows it down the act of charging the battery storing that electrical energy now you've stored some of that kinetic energy and when you try to start up again you can run from a battery through an electric motor and get your car moving again like I said, the problem with batteries is it takes time to have that chemical reaction reverse and get that energy into the battery. And your car is stopping suddenly, you can't harness all of that. You can maybe harness a fraction of it. But with supercapacitors, you can harness much more of that energy and store it momentarily until you're ready to need to use it again when you're starting up and you need to get that energy back out. So they're very handy in those situations.